This cut in the discount rate, the assumed return on your investment portfolio, is a big deal. Uh, it's going from 7.5% down to 7% three years' time. You're the guy who has to hit or ideally beat that target. Is 7% low enough? Well, it's a, a great question, and it's a consequential question for a pension fund like CalPERS. Uh, setting the discount rate, setting the assumed rate of return is the, really the highest order uh, decision that our system has to make in order to protect the system, provide for the sustainable and sustainability of our system for generations to come for our beneficiaries. So a very important decision, very consequential. Uh, is seven uh, the exact number? It's not an exact science. Is it a reasonable number? We believe so. We believe it's a reasonable number uh, over the long term. Again, as a long-term investor, we look out 30, 40, 60 years, and uh, much of the reduction of our assumed rate of return really comes from our intermediate forecast, which for a pension fund like CalPERS is about a 10-year If forecast. it were up to you, would the number be lower? And I ask because the argument for a lower assumed return is a powerful one. Right now we live in a low-rate world, right, with commensurately yeah. low returns on risk-free assets and everything priced over those risk-free assets. Your own advisor, Wilshire, argued for a 6.2 percent assumed return. And a number of well-regarded professional investors who've given the subject some thought, like Cliff Asnes, for example, of AQR, or Howard Marks of Oak Tree, a firm with which CalPERS has some investments, think five or five and a half is more realistic. Well, we looked at all of that advice and the, the analysis on our own as well. And in establishing our assumed rate of return, we took into account the low interest rate environment that, uh, that you uh, allude to. And in building our capital market assumptions, we assumed over the next 10 years our fixed income portfolio would achieve about a 3.5% return over that 10-year time frame. I think that's reasonable. And on top of that, in constructing our portfolio and constructing our assumptions that undergo it, we assume our global equity portfolio, our stock portfolio, will return about six and three quarters over that 10-year period. I think that's a reasonable assumption. The intermediate period that I referred to a little bit earlier, the 10-year period for CalPERS, uh, those capital market assumptions add up to that 6.2 number. And I think that's a reasonable number over the 10-year time period, intermediate period, uh, to expect returns from a broadly diversified portfolio like CalPERS. Uh, now, our actuaries look out longer than that 10-year period. They look out, they took our 10-year forecast, and they look out from years 11 to 60. Yeah. And in, in doing that, they assume some correction, some reversion to the mean in interest rates. It's, I think it's reasonable to look out years 11 to 60 that we're going to have some return to normalcy in the interest rate environment. And if that happens and when that happens, we, we should expect some higher rates of return in the out years. So when you add all of that together in our analysis, looking out over a 60-year period, is it reasonable to assume that we could achieve a 7% return over that time period? And it's premised, really premised on this intermediate period of getting about a 6% return. But I, that intermediate, in that intermediate <clears throat> period, the underfunding situation continues to be exacerbated if you don't hit that bogey. That's, that's exactly right. And that's, that's, that makes your job nearly yeah, impossible. It makes it tough. It makes it a challenge. And that's the word that you know, I've used over and over again with our investment uh, committee. And uh, going into this period over the next 10 years, we have quite a challenge in front of us, not only the, the market challenges that we just discussed, but the funding status of, of CalPERS. We enter this time period 68% funded, now with the discount rate being lowered, about 64% funded. And we have to pay attention to that. The cash flows of the CalPERS system as a maturing fund, the demographics of the baby boomers retiring, uh, the cash flow of, of CalPERS has now turned negative. In other words, we're taking in uh, less cash than we're than paying, paying out. out. So it's a challenge, and we have to pay attention to that. And one of, the, one of the ways we do that is to, one, yes, invest for the long term, but to pay attention where we can take some risk off the table, where we can redeploy uh, assets within the asset allocation out of equities into 
uh, other asset classes, we're taking advantage of opportunities to do that. Let's talk for a moment, Ted, about your critics, because you've got many, whether you <laughs> like it or not. Uh, they say that CalPERS returns over the past couple of years, which have been well south of that new 7% target, are evidence that you and your investment team are failing. And they accuse you of trying to sow panic by advocating, as you did, for a lower assumed rate of return than 7.5%. How do you respond? No, we're not panicked. And uh, we're cognizant of uh, critics on both sides of the equation, saying that uh, the return assumptions are too low and others saying it's too high. I think what we look at is look at our 20-year return number over the course of the last 20 years. It's right at about 7%. Uh, look at our five-year number. It's at 8%. Uh, but we're also, you know, time periods uh, are important. Uh, Three-year numbers, more like five. Our 10-year number, more like four and a half. So there's risk to uh, this portfolio. And um, in any given year, uh, we know that we might underperform uh, that 7% number or overperform. Our critics don't mention the 18% return uh, that we received three years ago. So there's a decent amount of volatility in the portfolio that we account for. And the important thing is over a very long period of time, you know, as I said, I think a 6% return with a broadly diversified portfolio over the next 10 years is reasonable and a 7% assumption over a long period of time. What's your macro overlay, Ted? As you determine the asset allocation and you make investment decisions, what do you expect for U.S. growth and inflation, the world economy, <laughs> the interest rate trajectory, bond yields, equity yeah. valuations, all of those things go into the yeah. mix? Yeah, we look, we look at the whole mix. Right. You know? I, we see moderate world growth. Uh, we've seen moderate growth here in the U.S. At, at Faster than what we've seen over the past several years? We, ho we, ho we well, hope so. Hey, we can all hope. We can all, an investment we, we hope so, exactly. We hope so. That, that could occur. Our base case is that the U.S. has grown about 2% out of this recovery over the last seven and a half, eight years. We're expecting that to continue. Moderate to tepid U.S. growth, but sustained. World growth, 3 3% plus. And there are risks. There are risks to that growth, both on the, the downside, but also on the upside, as I just alluded mm -hmm. to. There's, um, but it sounds to me like you are a subscriber to the call it new normal camp. I'm a subscriber to low base interest rates to start this next 10 year run and moderate growth. And as the new normal camp has just you know, described it, there's some pretty heavy demographic forces at work across the globe to, to keep a growth muted, particularly in the developed economies. You can't ignore the change in the political environment. Yeah. What's the Trump impact? Well, it, it, it raises and widens the tail risks uh, on both sides. Uh, there are opportunities on the positive side that I alluded to mm -hmm. uh, to have uh, more of a focus away from the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve to uh, politics and policy moving to the forefront and hopefully am amplifying uh, the growth prospects of the U.S. So those are, are positives that could affect the, you know, the base case. There are also some negatives, uh, discussions around uh, tariffs and our trade agreements, immigration. These are all things that could impact and slow uh, growth here in the U.S. around the globe. So, uh, do you for worry us, about them? Yeah, we do. We we worry. Uh, we spend a lot of time worrying, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know we worry about downside risk uh, probably more more so. Uh, more asymmetrically than we worry about the upside risks if, if the stock markets are going to do well globally because of the position of CalPERS. I, but do you worry about those downsides? You talked about the increase in tail risk, mm -hmm. both on the upside and the downside. Do you worry more about those downside risks because of the change in political leadership? Uh, it's widened. It's widened the, uh, the range of outcomes. The range of outcomes. And uh, until we see the policies that come forward, uh, it'll be hard to handicap which, uh, which outcome will play out, but the prospect of having a, a unified U.S. government uh, across Congress and, and uh, the federal government uh, allows for greater action, and action uh, can have uh, either result. We talked about the kind of return you think you can generate over the next 10 years, 6%-ish. Can you do it without dialing up the risk in the portfolio? 
Well, that was one of the, the major impacts of lowering the discount rate, is that we can keep the risk profile that we currently have in the portfolio uh, uh, intact. Uh, so, so, yes. Uh, why, so right now, you've got about 9%, roughly speaking, allocated to private equity, yeah. and about 60% <clears throat> to equity in general, or growth, as you right. call it. Right. One of the questions that keeps coming up for pension funds, and I'll put it to you, is sure. why, given that a pension plan has mostly known liabilities, mm -hmm. so much of that is in public markets, right? Why pay that liquidity premium? Well, uh, when you in, don't in need the, the liquidity. <laughs> well, you need uh, some, but I, I think for one of our great strengths and advantages is our long term positioning. Uh, so the ability to uh, realize an equity premium uh, in the public stock markets is an advantage of ours for the long term. In private equity, the ability to uh, invest not only in the private markets, but to lock our capital up for long periods of time, we think plays to our advantage as a long-term investor. Is the problem with private equity, because CalPERS allocation has come down from 14% only three years ago, is the problem with private equity the asset class or the asset managers? Well, uh, we think we're, we're committed to the asset class but less than you used to be. Uh, less than we used to be, that, but that's more of a function, one, of our, the denominator, two, the valuations, both in the public equity markets as private equity markets. We've been net sellers in the private equity, and we think that's the smart thing to do during a buoyant uh, market. Um, there are uh, times to invest in the private markets, and we're comfortable taking our our foot off the pedal a little bit at this point in time, and if we see you know, more favorable conditions in the future, uh, we will be actively moving back in, into So you the think about markets. it dynamically? We do. So if valuations remain robust, you'll take it down to below 8%, which is where it's headed? Yeah, we could. We could. What We're do you think private equity can return over the long run? Well, what, we, what, we've, est what we've estimated in our forecast is a net 95 basically return. A lot lower than historical norms. A lot lower than historical norms, and we think that's, that's reasonable. Among your private equity managers, who's doing a good job? Well, I, you know, one of, the, one of the real benefits of, uh, of private equity is to be able to access some, some very talented managers, wow. and their returns have been per persistent over time. So we've been reducing the overall number of private equity managers. Right. So uh, the, the uh, the collection of private equity managers that we have currently in, in the fund is really a reflection of managers that have done very well for us over long periods of time. But are you? So I'm, not gonna, so I'm not going to single out uh, you know any anyone by name. Are you finding yourself? Well, let me let me ask you this question instead. Sure. Um, what's your biggest beef with external managers? I, you know, I don't really have a, a beef with the external managers. You're happy we, with the fees they're we, charging? We, we, re, you know, we rely, we rely on the talent of external managers, particularly in our private asset classes. Uh, and we've been able to access some of the very best talent in the world. It's expensive. Uh, talent is a marketplace, just like all the other marketplaces we compete for. And uh, it's, it's expensive. Uh, but we monitor whether or not, from a net basis, we're receiving the returns from that. Do expense. you see more room to squeeze those fees, or are you now getting pushback? Well, there's plenty of room to squeeze given uh, the uh, fee arrangements, particularly in private equity. In other words, they're still charging you too much. <laughs> yes, yes. You know the uh, the, and that's a reflection of the marketplace. There is such a desire. Uh, for return, that there is incredible amounts of capital going into these vehicles, and that competition gives comparative advantages to the general partner. If you think about the general. amount of money you spend every year on private equity fees, and we're going to know what those fees are soon, yeah. how, by how much do you think you can reduce it in percentage terms? You know, we're, we'd like it to be to be lower. You know, what we've seen is uh, CalPERS and other institutional investors have been. Uh, paying on an asset management fee basis, 100, 120, 150 basis points. Uh, when you look at some of the other private asset classes, real estate, infrastructure, mm -hmm. those fees are more in the 50 to 70 basis points. So that's that's that's, that's where you'd like to get. Yeah, I would. Is if that we, realistic? 
Uh, not in the current marketplace. Uh, there's too much capital uh, chasing the private equity uh, business model. Uh, Ted Kalpers famously led the, I'll call it, pension fund stampede uh, out of hedge funds. Um, do you have any regrets? No, you know, it's uh, uh, one for this time period, the last couple of years, it's, uh, it's been a, a good decision for us. But really, given the scale and size of CalPERS, we, we just don't see it as being Can you uh, envision scalable. rebooting that hedge fund program? No, I don't, I don't think so, given our, our scale and the ability to deploy our assets into other diversifying asset classes is, uh, is more realistic for us.